Okay, so uh, oh, uh, we're going to cover all three sections of Chapter 4 in one lecture. Um, it's very methodical. It's very straightforward stuff. So actually not that much to say, so I think it's very realistic. Um, that said, we are going to kind of blow through some of the... Um, the uh, background uh, stuff, just because uh, it is th that stuff does take some time, and the analogies are so strong that I just don't think it's really all that necessary. So, uh, quick reminder: uh, y'all have seen this thing called the Taylor polynomial. Um, this is uh, the uh, Taylor polynomial at degree k for an appropriately regular CK uh, function. I uh, hope y'all recognize this um, question. Who cares about the Taylor polynomial? What's the point, right? Why do we write this? monstrosity down. And the reason is because the Taylor polynomial is the simplest function that mimics the function f we're interested in in the following senses, namely that it's a copy, it's got the exact same value as f at the point a. It's got the exact same derivative as f at the point a, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's got the exact same kth derivative uh, as f at the point a. Right? So it's, the, in some sense, the best, simplest mimic of the function that you're interested in. Okay, so uh, now y'all remember uh, uh, there's a bunch of details that follow in single variable. I'm just going to point out, you can do the same thing in multivariable. You can ask, what is the uh, simplest function that mimics f in an analogous sense. Now, uh, I say an analogous sense. Here's where we want to start looking carefully. Uh, what I have written down here, notice we want our, our new function to have the same value as f at a. We want it to have, now I'm tempted to say the same derivative, but now wait a second. If you're talking about first derivatives, there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of different partial derivatives, right? But if this really is mimicking f, it better agree with f in all of the partial derivatives. Uh, at the point A. And likewise, second partials, third partials, etc., all the way out to kth partials. So there's a bunch of requirements uh, to be a Taylor polynomial of a multivariable function. And uh, the general formula is a little hard to write down, frankly, but uh, I'm going to write down the k equals 2 formula. Here it is. This is all we're going to have any use for uh, in this course. Uh, and I'm going to say it not too surprising in the following sense. Um, notice, um, copycat the value, starts off with f of a, no surprise there. Um, check out the second term. It looks just like the single variable version. Derivative of f at the point a times x minus a. That's a practically stealing, right? It's just exactly the same second term that we, or what we might call the first order term uh, for the single variable <laughs> Taylor polynomial. It's just that now the derivative is a matrix. Right. Um, and then there is a oh, a second order uh, third term, and this one is a little bit weird. Uh, you'll notice it's a quadratic form, right? So it's a matrix, weird formula for the matrix, but it's a matrix times x minus a, then dot x minus a. And I hope you all remember quadratic forms from linear algebra class uh, however long ago that was. Um, there's a one-half out front, just kind of like you might have expected, right? So that's no surprise. Um, so uh, the uh, only other thing I need to point out is what this matrix itself is, and this matrix is called the Hessian matrix, and uh, here is the formula for it. It's just the matrix of second partials uh, for your function. So it's uh, all it is. It's really not such a big deal uh, of a uh, thing to write down. Okay, so uh, thus ends section... 4.1, right? Now, there's a bunch of other details in there about uh, uh, single variable Taylor polynomials. That's all review. That's stuff you all know already. Okay. Okay, on to section 4.2. This is another quick one really, in terms of the background ideas. Um, and again, you can get lost in the details, but I just want to hit the broad strokes. What we're going to focus on in this lecture is, yeah, but how do we do the X's? How do we get this done? Right. So um, <clears throat> in the broad stroke, let me remind you, in single variable, when you're trying to uh, find a max or a min in a, for a single variable function, let me do like this so we can fit it all in. Oh, almost. There we go. Um, <clears throat> there are certain conditions that you can write down 
which allow you to conclude that at that point, such as this one right here, the function is in the process of increasing. In one direction or the other. Now you look at this point that I highlighted, the function is not increasing as I go to the right, but if I were to say, yeah, but from that point, if I were to start going to the left, the function is increasing. So one way or the other, if these conditions are satisfied, there's no way that that is the maximizer you're looking for. Can't be the function's still getting bigger. Right? So pretty simple idea, and uh, this applies to almost all the points in our domain. Uh, there's a few points where it's going to fail, uh, but a lot of points in the domain are just instantly eliminated. None of the points that I've highlighted in green there could possibly be the maximizer we're looking for, but there are some points where one of these conditions fails. Right? Maybe it's not an interior point, namely a boundary. Uh, maybe there is a differentiability failure. Uh, I mean, so then I can't use the derivative to draw conclusions because it's not even differentiable, right? All sorts of ways that these three conditions can go wrong. And those points, we cannot eliminate. We cannot say, oh, yeah, well, uh, just, uh, you know, I mean, just look at it. There's no way that could be the maximum. You, you, I know it's level there, right? Points where it's level, smoothly level, yeah, that, may, that might be the maximum. Right? So these are what we call critical points. Uh, the reason we call them critical points is because uh, we don't know what's going on. These are points that we're going to have to take a closer look and check out. Right? And then there's that whole business in single variable calculus where you know, you've got to plug in and look at the values and see where it's the biggest and that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. So that's a very, very quick summary of single variable optimization. And I'm going to point out that... Um, a large part of multivariable optimization is the exact same story. There are certain conditions you can write down, not even hard to do it, um, that tell you that the function is increasing in at least one direction, right? So you look at this point right here, for example, and try to use your imagination as to what I've tried to draw on this surface, if you would. At this point, we're at this point on the graph, and it kind of feels like as we go sort of in toward the middle, if you will, of our domain, the function looks like it's going to be increasing. And that can't possibly be a maximum then. Right? So we can eliminate, again, a huge number of points. I'm not going to shade in all the whole, but practically every point in the domain we're going to eliminate as possibly having any chance of being what we're looking for just by that argument. And the ones that we then have to worry about, the ones that mm, actually might, ah, can't eliminate, ah, my elimination argument just doesn't work, is where one of the conditions fails. Notice how very similar the argument is going, right? And this is, I need to do about like that. Uh, so we call these critical points. Uh, so there is the matter of the boundary, and we'll deal with the boundary uh, later. Uh, but the differentiability failures, such as that point right there. And uh, points where the gradient is zero, such as that point right there, and that point right there, and that point right there. Uh, the, at least one of these conditions fails. I can't eliminate. I have to call it a critical point and think about it later. So that's the deal. Right? So this is what we're going to be doing. The sort of final punchline then is uh, we look at, just want to do like so, uh, we look at these conditions. We're going to, uh, again, separately, we're going to deal with the boundary in a few minutes. Uh, but don't forget to check where does the function fail to be differentiable? That could be the maximizer you're looking for. Right? You can't eliminate it because you don't know how derivatives work at that point. And check for where the gradient might be zero. Again, that uh, means you're kind of at a flat spot uh, on the graph. And again, that could be a maximum. Okay. Now, uh, I do want to uh, point out uh, we don't know what it actually is just because it's a critical point. Uh, there's all sorts of possibilities. It could be a max. It could be a min. It also could be all kinds of other things. It could be something called a saddle point. And uh, here's a picture of uh, a saddle point. You can see how it kind of slopes down 
in that direction, but it kind of slopes up in this direction. So saddle in the sense that your legs hang off in the downward sloping direction, but then it kind of goes up in the front and back to keep you from flying off the horse, right? Um, I think this is dated terminology. Uh, I think if they were to come up with this idea now, it would clearly be called a Pringle point, right? But now, anyway, they haven't updated the language. Um, now, uh, interestingly, uh, there are more weirder possibilities as well. Um, and this is, uh, be, this is one of the ways in which multivariable calculus is just stranger than single variable. And uh, I uh, wanted to show you all a picture of one of them that I think is uh, really interesting and also kind of funny. Uh, and that is this one right here. Uh, oh gosh, I should have clicked on this before. Oh, this is going to take me to some... Oh, gosh. Okay, that's my fault. Uh, anyway, uh, let's look at... Uh, Y'all can kind of see this right here, I hope. But uh, you see, so there's kind of two sort of bumps. Uh, and there's kind of a downward slope for his right leg, and on the back far side is for his left leg, and then there's a downward slope over here for his tail. Right? It's adorable. Um, so there is no single variable version of this. That's the thing. Right? There's not such a thing in single variable. So there's more room in some sense in two dimensions. If you have a function of two variables, there's more room to kind of move around and for things to get weird. Such as, for example. Uh, and then, by the way, if you scroll further down, somebody actually made a little saddle for a monkey and put it on like a golden retriever. It was hilarious. Anyway, you can look at that yourself. Um, okay, moving along. Uh, let's see here. Back to this. Um, okay, yeah, so let's see an example of this in action. We're going to find the critical points of this multivariable function here, and we're going to follow the rules on the previous page. Uh, step one, look for where... We might have points not in the interior. This function's defined everywhere. Every point's in the interior. The domain is all of R2. R2 does not have boundary, right? So no interior, excuse me, no, uh, no uh, boundary critical points, nothing to worry about there. Uh, next question, where does this function fail to be differentiable? Nowhere. It's a polynomial. It's differentiable everywhere. So no critical points for that second uh, criterion either. Uh, then we uh, look at the third criterion. Where does the gradient fail to be non-zero? That is, where is the gradient equal to zero? So you take the gradient, you set it equal to zero. Hope that sounds familiar. Again, flashbacks to Calc 1. Right? If you're optimizing, you take the derivative, you set it equal to zero. Same story. Right? Highly analogous. And then you just have to solve the algebra. Now, the algebra on this one's really easy. That right there tells you what x has to be. This right here tells you what y has to be. We have uh, two possible points, and uh, there you go. There's your critical points. Now, what are these critical points? Are these maxima, minima, monkey saddles? What, what are we talking about here, right? Hard to tell from a quick glance. Uh, we're going to come back to that question in a few minutes. Um, so uh, that's pretty much the process for uh, multivariable uh, unconstrained optimization, they call it. We'll talk about constrained optimization in just a second. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, a couple of things to check, and then, uh, yeah, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, just like in single variable. Okay, now, there's some annoying oddities of algebra that you have to worry about. And th this is, I mean, it's important. It, uh, this kind of stuff doesn't really come up in single variable. So this is a, uh, just another thing to be aware of. Uh, sometimes you have to consider separate cases. And so just for example, let's suppose this was the system that you ended up with. Um, and uh, notice that the first equation by itself does not immediately tell you values of x and y nor does the second equation by itself. Right? So what you have to do is look at one equation, conclude what you can, and then sometimes you have to recognize that the way you would actually draw a conclusion from what I have here, for example, x squared equals y squared, 
He has to recognize that there's two possibilities. We have a kind of a branching here, and I, it could be that X is Y. Yeah. It doesn't have to. It also is just as possible that X is negative Y. Right? So um, <clears throat> you got to be really, really careful when you find yourself in situations like this, and in a lot of high school situations, ah, you're going to take the square root of both sides, whatever, X equals Y. Yeah, you can't do that. All right, you got to be careful of the, the little finer points of algebra. Um, I'm going to point out the sum of the finer, weirder points of algebra uh, that students historically have trouble with. Um, I've addressed in a video I have on my, uh, what's it called, miscellaneous topics playlist. Right? Uh, it's called Algebraic Pitfalls. And eh, one thing you might consider is kind of just clicking through there to see the kinds of things that I address. Uh, there are some classic uh, algebraic mistakes that a lot of students make. I blame their high schools. All right, so let's consider these cases. Uh, first possibility, it could be that x is equal to y. That's one way that this first equation would be satisfied. But of course, we also need the second equation to be satisfied. So in that case, where x is equal to y, let's see what this turns into. This equation then becomes this, which allows me to conclude certain values of y. And that allows me to conclude certain values of x correspondingly. Right? So if y is negative 1, the corresponding x value, well, based on our case that we're looking at, also negative 1. Okay. All right. Now, again, that's half of this question. The other half is you got to consider just as likely, as we previously discussed, just as likely x is negative y. You can't just go, you can't just pick, right? That's not, that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah, you have to consider all possibilities. And that then, okay, well, if x is negative y, that makes this turn into a different equation of y. Uh, we get there then different resulting values of y. Now notice y being positive one comes up. We would have absolutely missed that had we not considered this second case. We would have missed a critical point. We might have missed the actual maximizer we were looking for, right? Entirely possible. So anyway, very very important. Make sure to consider um, make sure to consider the cases. Uh, last comment on this. Uh, remember um, when uh, when we're looking at a question, it's not a the question is not do you get the right answer, right? The question is whether your reasoning is valid. And so uh, there are uh, there is a point of view, highly misguided point of view, that says you know what I'm feeling lucky. I'm going to chance it, right? Uh, I think I'm going to find the one I'm looking for by ignoring uh, issues like this. And again, it doesn't matter. Even if the one that, that we were looking for is one that you find, it remains that the reasoning is not valid, right? You didn't consider all the cases. There were other critical points. You didn't actually compare with that at all. You cannot conclude that the one you found is the right one. Right? So don't again, don't think of it about the answer. It's not about the answer. It's about the reasoning, and the reasoning requires cases. Okay, how are we doing on that? Anybody buy it? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so how do we classify critical points? Good news, there's a second derivative test. Bad news, the second derivative test is weirder, significantly weirder in multivariable. In single variable, uh, you know, I, I, got, uh, I scrolled down too far. What am I doing? Uh, in single variable, you look at the second order term, you realize we just need to know when is this positive, when is this negative. It clearly just boils down to looking at the second derivative. If that's positive, the whole thing's positive, and we have a minimizer. Right? Old reasoning from Calc 1. Um, so the easy second derivative test uh, for single variable functions. Well, no longer 
Is that our second order term? Now our second order term is a quadratic form, which is weird. And you got to worry about uh, not just sort of looking at the individual terms. The linear algebra makes this behave in weird ways. We need to go back to all that stuff you all saw in Math 218 about positive, definite, negative, definite, etc. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, kind of simple in the sense that uh, we have these ideas, but how do you check if a uh, Hessian matrix is positive, definite, or negative, definite, or neither? And uh, things do get a little strange on that. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, Hessian matrices are symmetric. Right? They're made up of second derivatives, and for nice functions, those the order doesn't matter, so the Hessian matrix is symmetric, which means it's diagonalizable. Hope you all remember <laughs> that idea from way back when. And then I'm going to say yada, yada, yada. Uh, there's a bunch of linear algebra ideas. This is just hitting the highlights. Right? If you want to try to fill in the blanks and reason through exactly how this would break down, you can. You do have all the tools. It's just... <laughs> You know, it's it's a lot, right? So you don't feel any obligation. But here's the final punchline. This is our second derivative test uh, for functions of two variables only. Again, things get <laughs> a little weird uh, when you go to more than two variables. This is all we're going to uh, hold you responsible for. And uh, anyway, here's how it breaks down. Uh, Heavy player is what we call the Hessian determinant. This is just how the linear algebra works out. Um, <clears throat> and you have to consider, uh, again, various different cases. So one possibility is that the Hessian determinant is positive. And if that happens, I'm going to call this good news. Uh, when the Hessian determinant is positive, you get a really familiar looking second derivative test. Uh, look at the xx second partial. If it's positive, it's a min. If it's negative, it's a max. It looks just like the single variable second derivative test. So that's kind of nice. That's with a positive Hessian determinant. Um, on the other hand, also possible, Hessian determinant could be negative. And if that happens, it turns out and again, significant linear algebra we're not going to worry about. Turns out that means you have a saddle point of some sort. Namely, not a max, not a min. I don't know if it's a person saddle or a monkey saddle or a spider saddle. That I'm not clear. right? But we do know it's not a max and it's not a min. Um, and <clears throat> then there's, of course, various different ways that uh, none of the above can happen. Right? The Hessian determinant could be zero. Well, then uh, you lose, you, you learn nothing. It doesn't mean that it's not a max. It doesn't mean that it is a max. It just means we lose. It means we learn nothing. We draw no conclusion. Right? And then notice also kind of uh, missing from the test, what if we have the in-between case here where the xx second partial is zero, right? I mean, anyway, certain cases that we can't address. Okay. All righty. Um, okay, so example. Oh, let me do this. Try to get this to... Uh, come on. There we go. Okay, so let's uh, play the game. Um, we've already looked at this function. We found these critical points. Now we're going to classify them. Uh, in order to do this, I need to compute the Hessian matrix. Now, that's just a bunch of partials, but it's a good little exercise. You want to make sure that you kind of, you know, have the mechanics in mind of how you go about computing the appropriate partials, how they are organized to assemble the Hessian matrix, and uh, make sure you come up with uh, the right result. Uh, you can compute the determinant. You get this convenient little formula right here. And so now let's start thinking about the points. We'll start with uh, this point, negative 1, 0. Let's think about that. Well, that would make, uh, let's see, uh, let me uh, do it like this. Uh, that would make your Hessian determinant negative. Negative means saddle point. We've classified 
that critical point. Everybody with me? All right. Uh, okay, now let's look at the next one. Let's look at uh, this point. Negative one zero. Okay, well, negative one zero, uh, you plug that in to your Hessian determinant formula, and it is positive, which means we're not done yet, right? Positive Hessian determinant means you've got to look at the xx second partial, and the xx second partial is, uh, uh, well, it's this thing right there. And you plug in the point in question. Keep in mind, we're talking about that point 1, 0. Uh, the result is positive. And that means we get a positive. I hit the wrong, I'm sorry, positive. And that means we get a local min. Everybody OK? Notice how mechanical this is, right? You just follow the basically like a little flow chart, a little tiny little flow chart up here. Follow the rules, plug and chug, answers. Okay. All right, moving along. Um, this business about global extrema is a luxury that we don't have time for. This is not part of the course material. You don't have to know this. Um, short, real quick, just for cultural interest. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes global max exists, sometimes it doesn't. Here are some cases, pretty easy to persuade yourself, single variable functions on certain domains where there is no global maximum. And again, just kind of look at the pictures and see, yeah, there's just not going to be a maximum. Right? So uh, it turns out, roughly speaking, these three cases are pretty representative of the only three things that can possibly go wrong when you're trying to maximize. And so there is a neat theorem here, very important in analysis, um, that uh, as long as three conditions are satisfied, in other words, as long as, roughly speaking, none of these crazy stories happen, um, then there is a global maximum. And all you have to do is find it. So anyway, nice little math theorem there that uh, we're not going to spend any time on. Um, so uh, how do you check the boundary is the next thing I want to talk about. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, an idea that, uh, you know, kind of works but is not particularly uh, practical in many, if not most, cases. Uh, and uh, that goes as follows. Let's suppose you want to maximize this multivariable function on this domain and uh, we don't know what to do with the boundary and the big idea is to say okay well one piece at a time let's look at this part of the boundary right here that part of the boundary right there in green well on that part of the boundary I can write down exactly what the formula is for y as a function of x and that means uh, let's see here, I'll do it like this, that our function that we're trying to maximize, if I plug in y equals the function of x that it is, then the function simplifies significantly. So now all we have to do is imagine, well, as we go across then, as x increases, as we move across that part of the boundary, um, we have a single variable function of x. And you can just take the derivative, set it equal to 0, check the endpoints, just regular single variable calculus stuff. And it's fine. And you can totally do it. It's just the algebra gets a little ugly sometimes. This even was a kind of a, I don't want to say best case. This is a nice case in the sense that uh, I could actually solve for y as a function of x. Very often, you just can't, right, if you have a weirder curve. Not everything in life is a circle or a rectangle, right? So in those cases, uh, this just wouldn't work at all. Then, of course, you also have to consider the bottom edge. It's just there's a lot. Okay. So let me show you the better method. This is usually better, uh, almost all. I don't want to overstate it, <coughs> to quantify. This is 
what I think should be your default go-to method for finding boundary critical points. So uh, I'm going to point out that uh, that's a special case of a broader question of finding the maximum value of a function with a constraint. So for example, um, let's look at this question right here. I have a surface. I want to find the point that's closest to the origin, and I claim we have ourselves an optimization problem. If you think about it, closest to the origin means I'm trying to minimize something. I'm trying to minimize distance. Distance to the origin. And I'm going to use a clever move here where uh, rather than minimize distance, I, I'm going to point out the point that's closest to the origin also minimizes distance squared. That's a clever little hack, by the way. I encourage you to take advantage of that. It's a lot easier to write down the formula for distance squared than it is to write down the formula for distance. No square roots. Right? So that's, that's, a, that's a win. So this is the function that we're trying to optimize. It's what we're going to call our objective function. But I am not just going to let x and y be kind of whatever. Right? x and y, if we want to make this as small as possible, how about this? How about x and y are both zero? All right, that'd be the easy answer. That's going to make this as small as it possibly could be. Right? Not allowed. We have a constraint. We're only allowed to look at points that are on this curve. So that's a constraint, right? Zero, zero doesn't work, right? Zero, zero doesn't satisfy this equation. So when you have a constraint, uh, you want to look specifically at the function whose level set gives you your constraint. Right, so there's some color coding. Uh, so this function in red here, x squared plus y squared minus 3xy, that's the function whose level set gives me my constraint. Um, this is uh, set up in this particular way, right? So why level sets? Why are we messing with level sets? Because life is going to work out well if we do, right? So this is a uh, you know um, uh, convenient idea, as it's going to turn out. And uh, if you do that, then we have a powerful method for doing the constrained optimization. So just a couple of examples, by the way, of how this comes up in real life. Uh, uh, engineers might reasonably want to find yourself dealing with a question like this. You've got a certain amount of materials with which to build a box. You want that box to be able to hold as much volume as possible. Right? So what we have then is we have a function that we want to optimize. In this case, I want to maximize the volume, right? And my constraint is that I only have so much area. So the air, whatever that area is, that area of the box is the thing that I'm constrained by. That's the function that has to be a certain fixed value. Okay, uh, econ majors or future business people um, might want to deal with allocating a limited budget. Again, there's your constraint. You only have so much budget. You have so much money, uh, you, you're starting your business. You can't just decide, I think I'll spend $4 trillion on uh, materials. No, you can't. That's not on the table. You can't get that loan, right? So you have a limited budget. And with that uh, being the case, you want to maximize, let's say, your productivity. Or maybe you want to maximize uh, revenue, or maybe you want to maximize profit, or maybe you want to maximize whatever, right? Whatever your sort of um, um, uh, mission of your business is. So again, constrained optimization problem. Okay, how to do them. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, <clears throat> again, we're going to eliminate most of the points by a simple argument. This is shockingly similar to the single variable case. 
just different geometry, different sort of uh, details and how it works out. But if you consider this scenario where the functions are both differentiable, we want to be able to use derivatives. Hard to see where this one comes in, but we do need, it's very important, to make sure that the constraint gradient is not zero. It's a big deal. And uh, again, it's going to turn out we need for these two gradient vectors to not be multiples of each other. I know it's hard to see immediately why these would be interesting, right? But the point is, if that happens, then here's our picture. Our non-zero constraint gradient points in a direction that's perpendicular to our constraint surface. Uh, and this says that the objective gradient is pointing off of that axis, namely not perpendicular to our surface. And then I point out, well, if that's the case, if this happens, if I've got a constraint gradient like that and an objective gradient like that, then just kind of drop a perpendicular and go that way. Right? Uh, this gradient tells you how to compute how the function changes as you move. If you move in this direction on your constraint surface, the function's increasing. And if at this point the function is increasing in that direction, that can't be the maximizer. The function's still getting bigger. So again, we eliminate most of the domain with uh, this uh, one little clever idea. So uh, just like in single variable, um, <clears throat> what that means is all we have to worry about is when those conditions fail. And that gives you our rules for critical points for multivariable functions, uh, uh, constrained optimization of multivariable functions. You gotta look at differentiability failures. You gotta look at what they call degeneracy for very good reasons that are well beyond what we can talk about in this class. But when your constraint gradient is zero, we call that a degenerate critical point. And then you got to check for when this uh, gradient uh, requirement happens. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, the uh, most interesting, the, the most, uh, I'll call it productive of uh, critical points that end up being maximizers most of the time. Um, and this idea uh, originates from uh, Lagrange mathematician Lagrange. So this is called the Lagrange condition. So three things to check. You've got a differentiability condition. You've got a degeneracy condition. You've got a Lagrange condition, French pronunciation. Okay. All right. So here we go. Let's do them. Here's my question. You'll notice I want to find a point that maximizes height. That means z is the function I want to maximize. Uh, but I only allowed to look at the points that are on the surface S and uh, notice the surface S is described as a level set. Specifically, it's a level set of this function. So this is what we call our constraint function. So now notice I did some interpreting here, right? I, the question was written in English. I interpret from the English, uh, what is my objective function to maximize? What is my constraint function that, uh, you know, <coughs> ties me down, limits which, uh, which inputs I'm allowed to choose? Everybody see how I interpreted the question so far? Okay. All righty. Well, let's play the game. Step one. Check to see where your functions might fail to be differentiable. Okay, so to the differentiability question, uh, these functions are both polynomials. They're differentiable everywhere, no critical points, but we checked. By the way, uh, a lot of students tend to, I don't know, this is an unfortunate mistake. A lot of students will just kind of blow this off because it's easy. This is the exact wrong point of view. This is worth a couple points, probably, and it's so easy, right? You're leaving money on the table if you don't do this. All you got to do is just eyeball. In most cases, we're probably going to be looking at polynomials. I don't know, not a promise, but it's usually very easy to just glance at your functions and be like, yep, they're differentiable. And that's points. So get your points, right? Don't leave the points on the table. Okay, next, 
we go to the degeneracy condition. We need to know when is that constraint gradient equal to zero. Uh, okay, well, there's my constraint gradient. Take the appropriate partials. Hmm, yikes. When is that equal to zero? Notice you can rewrite it like this. When is that equal to zero? So punchline, we're looking at this matrix equation here. And now again, flashbacks, right? Math 218, this early math 218, I would imagine, right? You're trying to solve a linear system. And how does one solve this? Well, there's various games to play. You can do a row reduction if you want, right? Um, I like to play um, uh, uh, singularity games, and uh, I can observe this matrix. The determinant is not zero by a pretty easy eyeballing of, the, of that computation. That means that this matrix is non-singular. Non-singular means there's a unique solution and zero is obviously a solution, therefore it's the only solution to that system of equations. Now, did everybody rem I hope that rang some linear algebra bells from long ago. Um, so anyway, that's the only solution to that uh, set of equations. Now, tempting to call this a critical point. Um, but remember, critical points are points in our domain that we can't eliminate. Here's the thing. This point is not in our domain even. So I don't even need to eliminate it. Right? The, the whole point here is we're trying to it, we're trying to find points that couldn't possibly be the maximum we're looking for. And true I can't eliminate this, but I, I don't need to because it's it was never on the table in the first place. It's not even in my domain. So Again, common mistake. A lot of students will label this as being a critical point because of the algebra, right? And uh, you got to remember to check, make sure it's actually on your constraint set. And if it's not, such as in this case, then you just ignore it. How we doing? Okay. All right. Okay, last condition. Uh, we look at the Lagrange condition. Uh, and so there's more to write down here, and the algebra gets weirder. Um, <clears throat> you can uh, take your gradients, right, and write down gradient F is lambda times gradient G. You get those three equations right there. Uh, as we just discussed, keep in mind, the only reason we have any interest in the Lagrange conditions is because we're trying to figure out what to do with the points on our constraint set. So if we come up with, you know, if this comes up with some point not on our constraint set, uh, I don't need to eliminate it. It's not, it was never interesting in the first place, so we don't care, right? So in fact, when you look at the Lagrange condition, don't forget to remember to add in your constraint equation. I only care about points that satisfy the Lagrange condition if they also satisfy our constraint. So make sure to put that in there, otherwise, uh, you know, again, you're not going to have a complete analysis, and in fact, your algebra won't work. Okay. Ah, uh, hi. And I see that we are kind of out of time here. Um, yeah, shoot. Okay, well, um, I am going to uh, uh, point you all to uh, recordings that I've done in past years that talk through all the details of the rest of this algebra. Uh, there's also some uh, interesting little points of algebra in this next example and this next example. I'll send you those recordings. And uh, it's just algebra, though. So, okay, see you all later. Have a good one. See you on Wednesday. Yeah,